for good afternoon or evening um, for, for, for both Steve and Roger, uh, who are representing from around the world. Um, more and more, I'd say resellers are being defined as ICET, IT asset disposition companies or ITADs. There's several organisations around the world that who certify that an IT reseller has processes in place preventing the unauthorised exposure of customer data, preventing dumping of electronic goods in an environment unsound manner, and track customers' assets through the process. Legislation, regulations, investors, good business practices are driving enterprises around the globe to require that IT resellers, they work with an ITAD certification. If you're handling customer data or electric goods and a data or environment breach happens, you and your customer uh, can be jointly liable. Now, it has been uh, a big 24 hours for these two guys. Um, we've got two organisations being represented here today um, that will help uh, address those standards and those issues. Roger Grieve is from Seri, a non-profit organisation. Their product is called R2, Responsible Recycling. R2 started in 2005 and is now the third iteration, R2V3. There are almost 1,000 facilities in 33 countries worldwide who offer R2 certification services. We've also got Steve Mellings from ADISA, who is IT Asset Recovery Certification. Recently updated to version 8, ADISA is a, U is a UK developed global standard for IT providers. The current version of the standard is approved by the UK Information Commissioner as a UK GDPR certification scheme. I'd like to introduce these uh, two speakers to, um, to tell us what, what they're about and, uh, and how they can help you. Thank you. Many thanks, Brett, and good evening as it is here to, to everybody. Um, good morning in your time. Um, as you've heard, this is the third se session for myself and Roger, but thank you, ASCDI, for the opportunity um, of speaking. It, perhaps it might start because people have probably never heard of, of uh, certainly Adisa. Uh, I would have thought you probably heard of R2. Maybe we should introduce the schemes a little bit. Roger, maybe you can kick off. Is that okay? Glad to. And yes, good morning, everyone. And, and Brett, nice job kicking things off here and, and setting the stage for us, literally. So um, R2 is a standard for electronics reuse and recycling. Uh, primary aims are for positive outcomes in three main areas, uh, environmental concerns and protection, safety of workers in the communities, and data security. Underpinning the entire R2 standard is a sense of sustainability, and circularity that you were just talking about, Brent, in, in the previous uh, previous introduction. So, it's uh, it's now in, in use in 37 different countries around the world. And I, I just checked. There's there's two in in Auckland and uh, 25 different facilities throughout Australia that are certified to R2V3 right now. And uh, we're we're very happy with that. It's uh, it's been going for quite a while now, and it's a uh, it's pretty well accepted in, in, in many countries. And we're, we're happy to provide best practices uh, to their facilities and thus to their, their, their clients. Fantastic. And Adisa, as, as Brett said at the beginning, we're, we're UK based. Our footprint is predominantly UK from the ITAD certification. Um, our ITAD standard or certification, um, we spent the last three years evolving it with the regulator here to align it to law. So we're specifically focused on data sanitization and compliance. So the R2 standards are much, much broader, more detailed standard across all aspects of, of ITAD, whereas ours is a very niche part of the asset recovery piece, engagement with the customer and the compliance wraparound to ensure uh, you meet the regulatory requirements um, within Europe. So we're a UK GDPR certification scheme with standard eight, and we have the application into the European Data Protection Board. Um, to carry that forward across Europe. Um, we also have a test lab, which is uh, a little bit different as well. So we certify data sanitization products. So we've got quite an expansive lab uh, here just outside of London. Um, so we work with companies worldwide uh, testing their software products to ensure that they uh, do what they should be doing, which is to, to keep data from being able to be recovered using laboratory level of attacks. Um, now, what we sort of decided between yourself and, and Roger when we met to talk about these events was um, you've got two certification bodies speaking. And so people are going, well, aren't you competitors? Don't you you hate each other? And I think the answer safely is no. Um, I think what we've reached over the many years um, of working alongside each other is that, that there's, there's different aspects to certification within the ITAD community. 
uh, that will be mean that some certifications are a better fit for certain types of business than others. And I think um, with ourselves, what we do in this first part of our presentation, if you like, is just explore the breadth of certifications that are available and their relevance, perhaps, to, to the sector. Um, so, Roger, I'm, I'm going to lead you on with this one a little bit, if I may. Um, if you were a non-certified company and you're looking to take those baby steps towards moving the business forward, where where would you like to start, do you think? What would the device, your advice be? The advice is similar to when computers came out 35 or 40 years ago. You, you bought the computer based on what you wanted it to do and what software you wanted to run rather than the computer itself. So too with certifications. It depends on what you do and what the scope of your operations are. Uh, it, it would determine the, the, the most accurate course to become certified. For instance, if your company is focused primarily on data security concerns and not much else, then ADISA is, is probably the way to go. Uh, underpinning both of our, our standards is a set of management systems, which we'll talk about in a moment. If you have uh, uh, materials that you need a, a, to repair and return or find places to recycle the materials and back for materials recovery, then R2 is probably a better fit. So it's all a matter of, of what, what each company does and, and what, they, what they need to do. In addition, there, there's the benefits of, of, uh, of certification as opposed to the, to, to the costs and time and money. So way does that as well. Yeah, I agree. And I'm going to pick up on Brett's piece to start with, actually, where he talked about relevance. And I think that's really important. Um, you know, I guess, I guess I'm a sales guy. I work for myself. So all, all people who work for themselves have to be salespeople. And if you're looking to do something with your business, you've got to be able to get an, a return on that investment. And, and I think where you're talking about certification, many view it as a cost. They don't see the benefits. We'll cover internal and external benefits in a bit. But I think an awful lot of certification allows you to become more relevant to your customers and allows you to verify that relevance. And I think uh, Brett was talking about, again, being sticky with a customer, which I love that term. We like, I like stickiness with customers. It makes you very difficult to be removed. And I think the sector that I've seen, and I've been kicking around in the sector since about 95 is that we've seen it evolve into services. And I think what, this is where the, the different certifications sit in because there is no a, a sort of um, blueprint ITAD. They're all different. They, they kind of say, say they do the same thing, but they do do it differently. And depending on where your business is, I think you will be able to pick a sweet spot for getting on the certification process. Um, personally, I think 9001, an ISO standard is brilliant, um, putting quality management systems in place good repeatable processes and procedures would enable you to bounce from there. But I also think that if you're looking at the circularity piece, the work that uh, Siri have done on R2 V3 on the reuse piece is the best piece that I've seen worldwide. Yeah. And I think that's really going to become the, the boilerplate, if you like, for closing that loop of circular IT to get products that are being prepared for reuse to be really fit for purpose and be professional and actually have a really positive experience for the next user of those equipment. And the point I'm trying to make, I guess, is that certifications can be really beneficial. Um, rather than it just being a cost, they can be really beneficial to help guide businesses forward to where the industry is moving. And I think, Roger, I'm probably jumping ahead a, a little bit here. Um, we talked earlier on about the benefits of certification, and you covered very eloquently the benefits of internal benefits of getting certification. Maybe you can just explore that again. Uh, for this new audience? Sure. We've noticed all along that the, the benefits of being certified are bi-directional. It's one of the main answers. If you ask the question, why should my company be certified? The, the, the two directions are internally for the company. It helps improve the operations by making a company think about things like training. How do I document training? How do I onboard an employee? How do I make sure the environment is, is safe for the employees to work in? And then how do I protect the environment? How do I protect data moving through the company? Things like that. A management system on which R2 is built as well as, as Adisa uh, does a lot of that. Having the things like document control and management of change and monitoring and measurement and, and the, the mandatory management review, those are all fundamental operations that make any company better. It, it allows the company to grow, allows the company to ad adapt to change, to change customers, to change product lines. All these things are a natural result of being certified to a management system. On top of that, then, is a, is a layer of specifics like ADISA 
or like R2 that is tuned exactly to what your company needs to do. And then uh, uh, we'll talk about this maybe a little bit more, but on top of that still is the ASCDI certification, which calls for management systems and uh, and, uh, a certification such as ADISA or uh, NR2. On top of that, though, is, is, is ethics pledges and checking to make sure that companies actually do what they say they do, even in the course of being certified. So it's three layers. It, it, it's, it's like a parfait if, they, if you have those in Australia. So um, it's, it's a, a layered things uh, uh, that uh, start with the management system at, at the bottom and work through the, the other levels. So. And I guess what we're talking about is the evolution of, of the industry. Um, again, going back to, to, to Brett's piece, uh, you know, where the industry is today is somewhere very different than it was 10 years ago. I also think where our customers are today uh, is very, very different than they were maybe five years ago. I think COVID homeworking saw a relaxation of some of the controls that they put in place yeah. about how they operate. Um, I'm well, seeing them. Sl- that, that speaks to the other half of that 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 bifurcated benefit that the uh, the idea of the outbound benefit of certification is to back to the customers. The customers can be able to relax a little and rely on the fact that this ITAD supplier has been adjudicated by an independent body and that body has said, yes, they meet all of these these requirements. So that's the external benefit. The fact that you can advertise to the world that you have that certification level. Internally, you're organized. Externally, you're proud of what you've done. And I think that's the key bit. Uh, I can see a question over here about why why get certified to a degree. Um, I think it's really important just before we talk about the why is about what a good approach to certification is in in my opinion i'll venture my opinion first um i think certification works really well when it's embraced within business operations it's not bolted on um too much compliance is viewed as a bolt on and it doesn't really work it's got to be embedded in day-to-day operations so if an organization is seeking certification that the first part of their journey needs to be to really embrace it uh, and to not view it as a you know as an appendix to their business it needs to sit within their business operations and that means Auditing is not a fear because you are compliant by default. Um, I think if you're looking at, um, you know, why you would therefore get uh, certified from an external benefit perspective, customers are more sophisticated now. It used to be that they didn't care. And, and Brett alluded to that, you know, drive up, um, highest bid wins and off you go. It was almost a, a raw auction process. And it's still that situation in many cases. Um, however, they are very much more aware of the potential issues associated with data, with the complexity of technology. So traditional overwriting techniques are, are getting more and more difficult to to use in, ter- in terms of uh, where media is now being embedded onto boards and things like that. Um, so you were seeing a far more complex requirement from the customers. And, and where complexity kicks in, that's where value is. So if, if everything was easy, there's no value. If there's no value, it becomes a commodity. If it's a commodity, it becomes about price. What we like is complexity because complexity equals skills, equals professionalism, and that equals how you differentiate yourselves. Certification for me is part of that. So if you're looking at building a a bar into an industry, if you like, of quality, of ethics, of professionalism, of expertise, certification is a barrier to entry from those who aren't at that level to actually those who are at that level. And so it can really help to shape uh, an industry in terms of those who can and those who can't. And it doesn't make it exclusive, of course, because everybody can up their game and rise to to the levels. But it means the customers, when they look at an industry, can see a clear differentiator. Yes. And that that endorsement of that differentiation is is the, the, the most outward benefit of being certified. But yeah, as, as, as you said, Steve, the, the idea of seeing um, certification as a, as a once a year audit and put it in a drawer for the rest of the year is, uh, is wrong and will probably not get you certified on a continuing basis because it should be just part of your operations. Uh, I had an auditor say to me once, a good facility should not have to prepare for an audit. Auditors should be able to come in any day of the week, any month of the year, and see what's going on and certify that facility. Maybe it's a pipe dream, but that's a that's a goal because it means it's totally integrated into the operations of that facility. 
And, and I agree. We're going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here, perhaps, because um, we do unannounced audits. The UK is a really small landmass, so you can travel around easy enough. And we people think, oh, you don't turn up unannounced. Yeah, we do knock on people's doors and we spend a couple of hours in there doing, doing sort of snapshot audits. Those who've embedded the processes into their business have, don't fear them because it's their business. If you've had a stretch to re be compliant and you've not fully embedded it, that's where the fear kicks in, which goes back to the point about, about your choice of certification. Because an ISO is staged audits, you know, and, and that's easier for you to control. Um, if you're looking at something which is very industry-based, uh, it's R2 or a DC, in my opinion, or together, ideally, because of the data protection piece at the front end and, and everything else, the expanse of the V3 is really, really good. And I think this is the key bit when you're considering certification really is, is why are you doing it? Are you doing it just to try and win more business? Okay, that works. Um, are you doing it to improve your business? That works. Are you doing it because this is about improving the sector? And what we're trying to do is improve standards across the board. That may be a pipe dream, but that's how I think we are moving forward as a sector is we're trying to move away from you know, the upstairs broker, we call them over here, who don't, don't have a facility, they flip deals, buy and sell 5% markup mm -hmm. into a proper service-led industry. And that's kind of how I see this moving forward uh, a little bit. And I think certification is going to really, really help that. Um, Roger, you mentioned earlier on about um, V3 being the, the latest edition when we were having a, a, a sort of a call just before this. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't appreciate, and I do, how much hard work goes into the creation of certification schemes. Maybe you can just elaborate on the hard work that went into the creation of, of R2V3. I'll do that only if you follow afterwards and talk about your end of it, because I know it's an equivalent amount of work. But yeah, R2 is it's a it is a uh, a product of years of work for each iteration of the standard. It, it was started back in in the mid two thousands with a with a challenge from the United States Environmental Protection Agency. They they said all these electronics recyclers at that point needed some set of 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 standards by which one to be judged against another. So. A group got together based on some large manufacturers and a combination of some, some existing electronics recyclers and then refurbishers and a few people from, from governmental agencies. And they, they formed a committee to write about this. This was the core of we, what we now has a, an established technical advisory committee that actually writes the standard. The technical advisory committee is made up of about 30 people of those three groups, uh, manufacturers, Facilities affected, being audited to the standard, and then governmental groups, consultants, and, and others. So collectively, they they write the standard, and when needed, uh, they can adjust the standard uh, during the, the, the course of, of it being issued. Once it's written, it is approved by what's called a consensus body, which is a subset of, the, of that committee. It's sent to the SERI Board of Directors. They approve it. And then it's submitted to, to ANSI, which is a, a, a governmental body that oversees, a, a, at this point, about 100,000 different standards around the world. We are audited by them, as a matter of fact, and have a procedure with, that we go through that calls for a 45-day public comment period when a new standard is about to be released. When comments are collected, if there are changes, another 45-day comment period happens after that, and then it's locked in. The standard can't be changed and adjusted to the whims of, 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 a, of an auditor or a company that wants a special break just for them. It's a, it is the, the standard, and it, it stands as it is. So it, we're, we're proud of it. It's a, it's, this last one was about four and a half years worth of work. I, I sat on, on the committee that helped write it, and uh, it was a uh, it was difficult. It, it took a bit. It, the, the the numbers are staggering with the number of total volunteer hours because the technical advisor committee is is all volunteer. It's, I think it was thirteen or fourteen thousand hours it went into the creation of the R two standard. So, your turn, Steve. What about you? Well, um, the, the the journey that I'll talk about my journey in a second, but maybe not as as long as as your journey, perhaps. But the the point I was trying to get across is one of the benefits of certification is is four and a half years of knowledge and of sweat and tears to look at what is realistic for the industry to do in a given process. What's the right thing to do? Can you know is it economically viable to do that? And it's weighing up all of those scenarios. For Adisa's perspective, we we have a committee, a steering group again representatives from Ministry of Defense and various other government entities and from the industry, companies from software sanitization vendors and, and other places. So you've got a, a you know, broad cross-section of, of motivations, perhaps. And you try and piece together a, a certification from, from those humble beginnings. Now, and we, we evolve ours every year um, 
or did up until this until recently and with the view of just trying to to see what the sweet spot was and on some of our earlier editions i think we pushed the industry too far loading too much cost so we rolled back a little bit and on this latest one what we've done is that we ended up working with the data regulator so looking at the requirements of gdpr uh, yes european legislation but looking at the requirements of that and seeing how itad as a business process sat into that piece of law and then we were what we were able to do was was to configure our standards slightly differently and introduce something called the data impact assurance levels that enabled the customer to start to control the process based on their own threat profile volumes of data categories of data impact of a data breach and risk appetite which for me means budget um but I think this is where the industry evolution is really good because for those who are looking to sell compliance services, well, Adis is already, certainly in Europe, we've already done the, the piece by getting the regulator to view um, the standard favorably as, as a GDPR certification scheme. And when you're looking at best practice about, about a whole bunch of other pieces, then the R2 V3 really hits that nail firmly on the head. And that's one of the big benefits, I think, is the collective experience of writing these standards mm -hmm. that, that the industry can benefit from them. And it's a roadmap for the industry to to move forward to. And to be crude, to cut the wheat from the chaff, um, because unless there are standards and those standards need to be applied vigorously, um, then really it does become a slightly a bun fight, if you like. And it becomes who sells the best, not necessarily who delivers the best service. And this is where I think certification, particularly in this sector, can have a huge benefit to the longevity of those companies who are trying to do it right. Exactly. And because it was a multi-stakeholder process for, for, for both of our, our groups, it, it is designed to, to set the bar just high enough to make it, a, make it an obvious indicator that this company subscribes to best practices in a number of different areas, but simultaneously make it achievable for companies to be able to actually do it. So it, there's, there's various ways of getting to that. It, it's a, it's a, a long process and we're, we're proud of, of the, of the roughly 1000 companies who, who have done so and continue to do so with the yearly audits. It, that's another part of it. There there's, it's on a three year audit cycle. The first year is a, is an audit of the entire system, every single requirement. Years two and three are sampled requirements, so not everything is checked in in the surveillance audits. And then, um, then year four again starts the cycle again with a complete audit of the entire system. Something I want to toss in, Steve, that I, you you didn't you sort of touched on, but I I really like about the uh, the ADISA standard is that it provides a roadmap for your customers to be able to analyze it numerically their level of, of risk and tolerance and, and capacity and, and amount of data being processed or a whole bunch of factors that go into a numerical score that comes up with their, their level uh, of, of what they need. And that can be compared against the, 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 the facilities that actually hold your certification because they can choose at what level they wish to be audited to. So it's a, it's a, it's a wonderful matchup of, of both sides uh, having a non-subjective way of meeting each other uh, in 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 your standard, it's it's uh, it's to be applauded. It, it's really um, thank you, Roger. It, it's um, you didn't say that earlier, but thank you. <laughs> um, I think um, what we're trying to do is, and again, it, it's becoming relevant. It's Brett's comment. Um, if you're talking to organisations who are releasing assets, um, you know the the disposition of their redundant assets is quite low down their agenda because they're firefighting with bigger issues, more regular issues, perhaps. And so they're looking for solutions that are easy to deal with, and they don't have the time to go away, even to audit some of the sites that they, they're sending their data to. You know, there's a fire and forget approach to this. Mm -hmm. So what we've tried to do, and certainly when we worked with the regulator, is that the regulator looked at the standard ITAD engagement in the UK, and they said that's not compliant with law across the board. And, you know, lack of contracts, and there's lack of weedy things within law. But what they looked at it, they said it's the industry leading the client. And, and that's great because those people in the industry who are, who are good and do the right thing and they're ethical, that's great because the, the data controller is in, is in safe hands. But there's also a part of the industry that isn't operating like that. And that's where the regulator looked at it and said, whoa, we've got a problem here because mm -hmm. the client's really not paying enough due diligence. The industry is, uh, is very eclectic. And so there was a high level of risk. And what we try to do with the data impact assurance level, the, the dial which you referenced, is to make it easy for the customer to dictate terms 
for the industry, which could then replicate the requirement with the service delivery. And that's how we managed to get the uh, recognition as a certification scheme, appropriate technical and organizational measures. Who determines that? Well, it's got to be the risk owner, the data controller, but they're not going to be able to go and do all of this in the level of detail. So we try to make it easy. Five, our tagline is five questions to GDPR compliance. And that's how the, the ITADs who are certified in the UK are really beginning to pick up business from their customers who are going, I'm terrified of GDPR. You have to, I have to ask five questions. Yes, that's easy. Thanks for making that problem go away. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the benefits, again, when you're talking about the evolution of the industry and certifications, moving away from generic certifications. ISOs are great, you know, brilliant mm -hmm. ISOs, but they're generic certifications. When you're looking at really building value, building value proposition for your customers, industry specific certifications are the way forward in my opinion i would ban to say that of course um because they are they understand what itad does they understand the risks they understand the engagement of the customer and they can hit that sweet spot of what's realistic to pick up your turn roger it's realistic to do this you can do it and make money but it's also a sufficient level to indicate that's the current good practice and yeah. that's where I think certifications really make a difference. And, and turnit is, is the operative word there. And you hit it, Steve. That, that's just to see where we are now in the marketplace uh, with, with many factors uh, affecting things. That when R2 first started 15 or so years ago, um, it was mostly recycling and materials recovery. That was a day when every computer was a desktop more or less, and every desktop computer had a had a big motherboard in it that was at least a, um, 25 or 30 centimeters on a side, and it was covered with the very thick gold contacts, and those have all gone away for the most part. So it, it's a uh, it's now down to cell phones with a uh, with a a, a sort of board in it, maybe one centimeter by five centimeters, and the gold is very very thin. So. The industry looks for other things to do, which is how to reuse these devices, how to repair the devices, how to protect the data on the devices, and how to offer those services outbound to, to clients again, rather than just working on the recovery of the materials once the once the devices are at the end of, of their lives. So it's um it's a, it's an interesting process, and it's been been interesting to follow that uh, our, our standards evolve to to match the the uh, the needs of the of the industry and the overall marketplace. Simultaneously, there's the whole sustainability issue, which we'll talk about in a, in a few minutes. Yeah, I was going to say we can talk CO2 reporting maybe a little bit later, which is which is perhaps something which the standards will need to look at uh, to evolve into. Um, I want to pick up again on Brett's lead about being service-led. Um, this is going to sound negative. Joe, Joe Marion will kick me for this virtually, of course. Um, but certifications won't work for organizations if they're, they're not on the front foot in the customer engagement. Um, they'll work if they're doing badge collection to say I must have this for an hour, you know, to respond to a tender. That's okay. That's a good reason to have it. But if you're really looking to affect change, not just in your business and your P and L, but actually also within your particular, you know, industry environment, it's about helping their customers go on their own journey, getting them to see the risk associated with their redundant equipment, helping them identify that you're managing that risk for them in a professional and consistent, repeatable way. And that's the need to have a service-led approach to how you sell your services rather than a reactive approach. And and I think Brett eloquently said earlier on about where the industry is today has evolved massively than it has for 10 years ago. And I think a lot of that is how it positions itself. Yes. I'll react to a requirement or I will help educate my customers. And it's a much more difficult sell to educate. It's a longer sell. It's a longer gestation period before you actually make money. Mm -hmm. But it's the better way of becoming stickier, in my opinion. And again, and this is where certifications, if you have them, are a, you're able to help that as part of your value proposition. Because people will say, hey, what's the risk of me have it ending up, my devices ending up in landfill? I look at your downstream auditing and you look at where the material management piece goes and, it, and it's absolutely phenomenal. There's so much detail that they're required to have, so many records that they're required to keep. Yes. You know, the, managing that risk for your companies through certification and the neat bit for itad is i just have to do what the r2 standard tells me that can be inbuilt your value proposition and that, that is something else that is it, it's an advantage to 
to having this available to, to people, even if they don't become certified. It, the, the, the standards are, are free. You can download them for, from our websites, respectively. And you can see what these certified companies are supposed to be doing. And if you're doing half of them, it means you're doing more than you did before. So it, we hope that people will, will come through and encourage their, their facilities to become fully certified. Uh, but the, there's a, the nature of, of best practices being promulgated by just the, the, our standards being out there. That, that's part of it, too. A, a question came in about legislation, how much legislation is it pushing the standard, which is a really interesting question, I think. It, it, it does have, have effect. Obviously, GDPR uh, would, would affect things. Our import-export uh, situation is, is being affected by, like, the Swiss Donna uh, agreement coming up in, in a year or so, uh, requirements for ESG reporting, things like that. So there are a number of uh, of external legislative forces around the world that do affect what, what we do. And they're, they're sort of slow to, it's, it's like steering a big boat. It, it takes a while for, for legislation to work into requirements of, of a certification. But the fact that um, all of our certifications require some awareness of ongoing legislation and compliance with the same. So that, that that's part of it too. And I think um, just to pick up on Joe's question about legislation, and this is again, one of the benefits, it sounds like I'm doing, doing a straight sales pitch at the end of the day uh, here. Um, it, some of this legislation is difficult to interpret. Uh, you know, legislation has to be broad because it's got to be applicable across a whole range of types of organizations and situations. So legislation is meant to be broad, appropriate, proportionate, they use words like that. Um, but your sta you know, standards bodies, we talked about the committees behind the standards and, and the way that they're constantly evolving. You know, we meet with with people. I had a, I called him my pet lawyer. He won't be on because he'll be in bed by now. I had a pet pet lawyer working with us during the development of the ICO. Um, it was during COVID, lived locally to us, and, and we just got chatting over over the internet. Sounds a bit strange, but um, and then after a while, he started lending me his his time because he was he was kind of a little bit bored. And it was fascinating to work with a regulator who who's there to to um, enforce the law and actually have a lawyer whose view was different than to have me on the sideline as a data protection consultant looking at it thinking it could be both of yours views. And I think this is where certifications are really, really good because they can help create consensus about the interpretation of legislation and allow the industry to move forward without companies worried about, well, have I read that right? I don't understand. Mm. I've had different advice. This is where I think we can really help through working together as opposed to in isolation uh, and working as a industry as opposed to as a company, because there's no doubt yes. legislation is complex and that it's, there's much more of it now. Data transfer has been a really interesting one uh, in the ability to move data across borders after Brexit became a big issue for companies. We had a, a company in Northern Ireland and Southern Ireland, uh, and it just became very difficult to actually move data carrying devices from one to another. And so we are able to help work with them and help them create a position that was compliant. Um, and this is where I think the idea of certification as a one-time fix is not necessarily right. I think it's more about a, a barrier to entry and evidence of, of capability, but then about the progression, both from the standards, but also the industry behind them as well. Um, talking of which, because we touched on sustainability and I'm just aware of time, so we've gone over the 30 minutes now. Um, Let's talk ESG, uh, Roger, very quickly from a certification perspective and the opportunity within ITAD. And I know that it's coming a little bit later, I think. And I know Damien's going to be talking about the legal piece, which will be fascinating. But yes. um, I think the ITAD sector right now is in a really exciting moment. Would, would you agree? Definitely. And it ties to a question that came in about demand being driven from the customer or from the ITAD facility. This, this uh, ties in perfectly with the ESG um, uh, topic because ESG stands, of course, for environmental, social, and governance. A set of uh, of reporting pieces of information that uh, that facilities do, that, that large companies do, that are required in some companies and about to be required in, in countries rather, and and about to be required in a lot of other countries. So the the environmental part is chiefly based on use of resources, uh, uh, carbon, water things like that. The, the social aspect is how employees are treated, what sort of outbound connections to the, to the immediate and greater communities are, are being done by the actions of a company, including the ITAD facility. 
and the governance is is how how things are taken care of the 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 internal structure on things like following a, a management system in addition to compliance with with the local and, and international law so it that collectively can be quantized into a a a a set of, of numbers or a report that says here how here's how this company is doing sometimes it's being used for financial analysis uh, for, for credit reporting or the, things like that so um, it's it's increasingly important and this is where an ITAD facility can can assist their customers when they can bring up the fact that uh, a, a a a laptop when it's manufactured has 80 percent of its total carbon expenditure taken up in the manufacturing process so 80 percent of that that carbon impact is done before you ever take it out of the box. So rather than having a new one created in a very short time frame and used by a company, why not extend the life of that by a couple of years and thus offset that carbon impact by just a little bit? A single laptop, not so much. But if a company has 500 or 5,000 laptops, it's a huge amount. Little things like that so that an ITED facility can help their clients with. And I think if you, um, I, I agree. And I think if you look at um, ITAD now, and again, I'm parroting Brett for earlier on, there's lots of different services that they can offer. It used to just be, I'll collect, I'll facilitate the removal, that waste collection piece that I, I always hated. People said that they were the dustmen, the trash men in the States. And I, and I hated that. It devalues what we do. And I think that ITAD's now got lots of different strings to spoke. Um, the question came in, is the demand being driven from the customer or the ITAD? Well, I guess it depends because you can you can fuel demand by um, by explaining to the customer what you can do. So if you talk about circularity and, and redeployment, you know, you can talk about repairing, upgrading and redeploying as a service within the ITAD function, mm -hmm. which will save them buying new. Um, you know, that's part of ITAD. You can talk about the social impact of donating perfectly serviceable devices. So so why destroy when we can sanitize the media and we can evidence that scientifically and, and we can label you to donate into the hands of people who are suffering a digital poverty divide from a technology or, perspective. But companies that have a remote workforce, for instance, scattered over a large area, uh, especially in the United States with thousands of miles, sometimes between a home office and an employee, if at the end of a, of a useful life of a computer, if there's data sanitization techniques that are sufficient, uh, that computer could be sold to the employee. It does two things. It extends the life of that laptop, thus eliminating the need to make a new laptop, and it saves the shipment back to the home office, thus further saving carbon impact from the from the transport of, of that device so there's a lot of things to consider and this is where it companies can work with their clients to uh, to be a a truly valuable resource Reich uh, on the on the european version of of, of this event today Reich sandler talked about sustainability as a service which i thought was an interesting concept of being able to sell this knowledge and this experience back to the customers uh, yeah and i think and picking up on joe's question here is um Nobody ever got fired for buying IBM. We've all used that phrase, haven't we? And I think the problem that you have is is trying to engage some customers on an intellectual perspective to pique their interest, to get them to change their ways because they're set in their ways and they said, no, I've always destroyed. I'm never going to get fired for destroying these devices. And it's, you know, it's above my pay grade to try and make those type of decisions. And this is where the industry has to step up to the mark to talk about handling objections for reuse talk about the benefit of extending the product life cycle and all the embodied co2 um it, and extending the usage of that you know this is where again where certification can really help because if one of their concerns and i've done this with a i did it with aeon they lied a case study with this where they wanted to donate some laptops and their it was one of their senior partners did this during covid so we had a uh, we had an advocate internally and all her team that said no, compliance security said no. And so we were able to help them manage their expectations on risk avoidance became risk management. Mm -hmm. And this was this was us acting, you know, as a certification body alongside one of our certified companies. And it's those type of engagements that certified ITAD should be having. Challenging conceptions, helping them see and realize the benefit of the potential of their old equipment, whether it's from financial gain, redeployment yes. and environmental game, the social impact of it. But certification is a key part to that. We're worried about data. Okay, let's talk about Adisa. Let's talk about our lab and the testing that we do. 
I'm worried about the environmental impact should should my devices end up elsewhere. Let's call the downstream management. I'm worried about my device not being a good experience for the next user and coming back on me. I donated a rubbish device. Let's look at the all the testing that goes on on the repair and preparation for reuse within the R2V3 standard. And, and the I, ISO 9000 that supports that process. Yeah, absolutely. Um, just reading a question. So that there are relatively few IT, ITADs in APAC. If I became an, an APAC ITAD, can ITADs from outside the region do business with me? What is a downstream partner? Um, I like community. I'll be honest. We, I like good people. You put them together. And if, if there's a common purpose and a way of doing work with each other, then you, you try and introduce good people. I, I've introduced people to, um, uh, I won't say actually just in case they're on the call because that might get me in trouble, um, to a couple of companies within uh, Australia, into a company in Hong Kong. They're not certified by Adisa, but I know the people behind the businesses and they're good people. And so it's about building a community for me. And I think this is where ASCDI kick in really strongly as well, because yeah. not all of your members will probably go along the certification route, which is bad for me and Roger, but you create that nice community feel of common ethics, common objectives, uh, and, and common, um, I, I guess, common focus about what you're in, in, in business to do. Make money, of course, but do a good job as well. It, we anticipated this in, in the creation of, of the R2V3 standard because within it is a, a section in, in one of the appendices about uh, uh, doing due diligence on a downstream vendor. If somebody is not certified, there's a set of requirements for what to look for if you need them to do data sanitization, for instance, or need them to do materials recovery. So th th it, it's possible to work with non-R2 companies and still stay certified to the R2 standard. We did that on purpose. It, it, there's not just restraint of trade issues, but the idea that there are some good companies that for one reason or another are not certified, and if they can prove they're doing things correctly without an R2 certification, they can still do business with, with R2 certified companies anywhere in the world. Uh, Import-export is a big part of the legal requirements in, in, in one of our core requirements, and that's a consideration as well. But yeah, it, it is possible to uh, to expand the network to good people, as Steve said. Yeah, agreed. Um, Joe's question now is, where do I start if I want to become a certified ITAD? How hard is it? <laughs> um, Roger, you can answer that one. <laughs> oh, yeah. You, you, it's late for you. I'll, I'll, I'll take this one. Here you go. Have another cup of tea or something. And then um, th there's a number of ways to, to begin. There, there's a, uh, a on, on both of our websites, there's a lot of information on, on how the process works. Um, and the there's introductory videos. Uh, there's a lot of information in what we have a, called a knowledge base that to download things, an entire section on becoming R2 certified, the steps you, you go through, resources. Uh, companies can either use the resources in the knowledge base and educate themselves. Uh, there's 40 different videos, uh, hundreds of articles in, in, in print, uh, uh, things like that. Um, or they can use a consultant who's done this before. We have a consultant list on the same R2, our, our same Seri website that are people that have passed the training for uh, to be an R2 lead auditor. So if they're trained as an auditor already, they know what to look for and they can help uh, as, as being a consultant. Hi, right, Brett. Welcome back. Good day. Thank you. So that, um, that's, a, that's the quick answer. How, how about you, Steve? Uh, give me a break um, here. Yeah, yeah. Um, we have a slightly different process in that um, we have what we call an onboarding program, which we like to mark, make sure that people have a good experience. Um, whilst we can't mark our own work because we're UCAS accredited, so we like like the Siri guys, we get audited. Um, but we want to make sure that people aren't um, frightened off by the process. So our onboarding program breaks and distills it down into key stages where we will evaluate the business over a period of time. And certification from, from Adisa's perspective can take anywhere from three months to 18 months, just depending on how quickly the organization who's applying wants to move. And we're there at every stage to evaluate in bite-sized chunks and to hold their hand through the process so that they their journey is their journey, not, not necessarily a forced journey. But at the end of it, when they get audited, they, they're in a place which I think gives them confidence that they shouldn't fear any future audits. And that's kind of our approach to this. As, as we wrap up, I, I've got a, a, a picture I would like to show. We don't have, really have a, a, a slide deck, but I will show you uh, one thing that is a picture of that. 
two Associated Press photographers taking basically the same picture eight years apart uh, in, in Rome with the announcement of two different popes. The picture on the left is be two years before the iPhone was released, and the picture on the right shows the result of an iPhone being released. So it's, it's, a, it's a fascinating single image of how fast our industry can change. And uh, I, I just thought I'd toss that in there as a, as a way of uh, pointing out where we are and what we have to adjust to, because the other changes that are equally fast are, are perhaps not as obvious as this one, but they still face us. We is the hook coming in, Brett, or shall we carry on? Uh, what's our time? We have uh, we've got five minutes to go, so if we can wrap up, that would be uh, fantastic. Would um, you like me to close out? You close out, and I'll uh, I'll, I'll finish up. Yeah, I'm I'm going to do a little call to arms. I'm I'm familiar with companies in APAC from a data sanitization perspective because we've tested products um, many around the Pacific Rim, um, but I think the sector worldwide is is going through changes and, and the states is different than Europe, um, which is different than APAC, no doubt. Um, but I think it's a really good time to be an ITAD. I think sustainability, security, scarcity of resources, technology evolving, becoming more complicated. These are all things which are happening today. Legislation getting more and more complex. This is all happening today. We're in a sweet spot. You know, all these companies that used to just send a van in and collect stuff all of the things that we've talked about now apply to that transaction. And I really think that um, that the ITAD community and, and the professional parts of, of the industry have a great moment to really make a difference. And we're well placed. I think certification has done a lot of the heavy lifting. I think we're well placed as a sector to push ourselves out of the weeds, out of that anybody can do this and into a really strategic industry. And as, as I wrap up, I'm, I'm thinking we're, we're surfing the wave of constantly evolving technology and uh, new devices coming out, Internet of Things, sustainability issues coming to the fore and a constant threat of, of data breaches uh, nipping at our heels. So, on the other hand, we're sitting here, three of us on three different continents, having a nice conversation. This yeah. is a it's a, it's a it's a great time to be in, in the technology business and uh, ITAD facilities uh, helping their clients uh, with those those problems uh, is, is, a, is a good thing. It's a time of growth and for, for all of us. Thank you, Roger, and thank you, Steve. Uh, it was a, a great presentation, and I'm sure uh, we learned a lot from it. Um, I think from my perspective, uh, every CIO that I've, uh, I've done business with over the recent years uh, is scared. I'll, I'll use it in Australia, they're shit scared um, of data and uh, and their obligation and and i think now as you reflected to become relevant is to be part of that 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 compelling scared discussion how you can help them and i think that uh having that discussion and how you can uh, you know give them a guarantee through compliance um, that their data will be safe and if you can help uh the itads here in australia those that aren't certified become certified just think the value that that itad is going to have to its customer so I, I invite those that are part of this call um, to please be in contact with myself and Joe. We can reach out to Steve and Roger. Um, we can also uh, assist with, we've got many uh, members here in, in, in Australia and New Zealand that, um, that can also assist uh, in, in getting that step underway, whether, whether you engage them or get advice from them. And I'm more than happy to help out with that. So once again, thank you so much for, uh, for, for, for the presentation. And, and the time, and I hope you can all uh, go to bed now <laughs> while we keep going through, and, uh, and, and we'll speak to you later. Thank you. Thanks Brilliant. very much. Thanks, Brett. Thanks, everybody.